Nathaniel Jillian. Hey, congratulations on your new documentary, State of the Unity. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Now I know I know you answered this question in the documentary, but you know, for for our viewers, uh, could you tell us what what initiated both of you to uh, to do this documentary in the first place? Yeah, um, it was actually the passing of my grandfather back in 2015. Um, and, you know, it was his life, his legacy. He was father of 10, you know, um, and my grandmother had passed five months before that. And so we just had this kind of moment of existential crisis, really, right? When anybody passes, a major pillar in your life falls. You kind of have these moments about, you know, who am I? What am I doing? What if? What is my legacy? You know, um, probably not going to have 10 kids. So I was like looking at other things. And, um, and so that was kind of the impetus that set us on the path. And then, you know, we were sitting in the car together and I had this revelation. We were sitting in this car that was probably, I think we got offered $75 cash for it for parts uh, the week before. And we were like, why don't we take this clunker to all 50 <laughs> states and have people sign it and turn it into a art piece that can help raise awareness for a good cause, that can help us grow our music careers, that can help the world come together in a peaceful and meaningful way using music, community, and collaboration. And that was kind of the beginning of the idea. Then I turned to Jillian and Jillian was like, I think we should do it. Then we called our manager and he's like, you guys are freaking crazy. Mm -hmm. But if you think you can do it, go ahead and try. And we did. And uh, here we are seven and a half, eight years later with a film that we're really proud of. But uh, that was the beginning moment. We actually turned on a, a, a little recorder and we recorded that night the idea because we thought if we never do it, at least we'll have this idea captured. And uh, little did we know eight years later, we'd be sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is wonderful. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure which is actually easier, having 10 kids or doing <laughs> this but you know <laughs> yes yeah that's yeah that's a good point for, for people who can do that that is that is amazing yeah <laughs> now now i i understand uh you know turning on that recorder for the first time um you know rec recording yourselves with, with the initial idea but when did it came to that decision that you wanted to record the whole journey at this you know this entire time because because i completely understand doing the trip Right. Yes. Recording the trip, that's a that's an entirely different animal. So that was where I came in. I figured if we did not record it, then it never happened. So like we'll see all these things, but then no one else, we can't share it. So I remember looking at Nathaniel and being like, babe, okay, first off, if we're going to do this, we have to go to all 50 states. I was like, we can't just go to the 48. We've got to go somehow. And we had to figure that out somehow to Alaska, somehow to Hawaii. And and then I also was like, we need to, we need to buy a camera. We need to record this. We need to create a documentary. And so, but like, I didn't go to school for filmmaking. He didn't go to school for filmmaking. We're musicians, we're storytellers, but we're like, this is a whole new world. This is a whole new medium. And so I just remember being like, I just have to pick up the camera and figure out how to turn this thing on and make sure I have a focus. So the majority of the shots that are happening in action where you just see him, I'm behind the camera a lot. So I learned how to grab the moments and the detail shots. You know, there's one shot that I particularly really enjoyed getting in the film. We're sitting in DC. It's right before we go on uh, NBC, Washington Channel 4. And it was the night before. And he's talking about how people manifest things in their lives, you know? And I just had this little shot where he's just sipping coffee and you see his hand and you see it going into his face. It's a closer shot. But I just really love those detail shots because it's like being a fly on the wall. You feel like, ooh, should I be seeing this? And that's kind of what... I wanted to grab while I was filming as much as I could. So was all this filming um, on, on a natural camera, like a camcorder DSLR, or is it cell phones? What will yeah. it? So <laughs> it's actually everything. for the tech, for the tech people out there who enjoy the, uh, I'm a gearhead myself. So we started on an icon. I think it was a, um, uh, yeah, it was, I can't remember the name of it, but it was like kind of low, you know, $500, I think was what we paid for it. And then, then we went to a cell phone and then that kind of went back and forth for the first two months of the film. And then we also brought on a filmographer or a, a cinematographer, yeah. videographer, uh, Leah Tribbett for the first week of the film. And she actually was able to document some stuff in some high quality. And also a GoPro. And then a GoPro. A GoPro and yeah. then we actually transitioned for people who like watching the film, you'll notice it about the third end of the film, we transition over to a much nicer Sony DSLR uh, A7R II uh, that we bought because we were like, we were capturing really great moments. 
And we were like, this feels like it's going to be a once in a lifetime type experience. So we might as well, you know, capture them a little bit better. So then we went to a little bit better DSLR and that was a, or a, a mirrorless. And that was a really big transition for the film. And we were so lucky that we did because like anybody who's gone on tour or lived in their car or lived with a great level of uncertainty in their lives, yeah. you know that magic can happen. And that's usually how it lifts you out of those moments. And um, but when we turned on the camera and we had it rolling, we were able to capture those moments that we really felt like were true magic Genuine. on the road. And um, mm -hmm. and we were lucky to have a decent camera in our hands to capture it because uh, those moments tend to come a little bit later in the journey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let's talk about the uh, the third character that went on this journey, the Volvo. Uh, yes. uh, you, you you guys named named uh, her uh, Unity, right? Yeah, the Unity, Unity car. car. That's right. Good memory. Yeah, she was a very important, very strong character in the film, and her journey to that point was when we were, gosh, just graduating college. He bought the car. Uh, from from his mom hand me down from yep. his mom because his other car broke down and so we did our first tours in 2010 in in her we actually used to call her old Bessie because she just was the car that kept going you know and we're from Indiana so like <laughs> Bessie's a classic cow name I don't know but then when we started the tour she just she just held the space so she was the catalyst between her just being grounded and then us sharing the music, like we'd perform music on top of the car from the back hatch of the car. She just allowed for people to come in and, and be in awe and wonder, which brought in people that would not normally be standing next to each other. They would not be talking to each other. They would not be engaging with each other or with us. And it was just this beautiful way to bring people together. It was a very unassuming way. You know, it's a car. It wasn't like a huge bus that was intimidating. It was something that everybody drives. And so I think that that nuance, that authenticity, that kind of, you know, that awe and wonder, oh, what is this? This is interesting. That's what kind of pulled people in. And then we were allowed to share music with them and then have really deep and meaningful conversations around her. From a technical standpoint, though, it was a hatchback, you know, and it had that flat back. And so we were able to get up on the car and that was like our little porta stage. You know, it was <laughs> like if when you watch the film, you'll notice that we were able to jump up right on top of the car and it has this flat area where you can stand and perform. So logistically, it actually worked really well for its purpose as well. So it was just a clunker and we were able to get, I think we had 265,000 miles when we started, we got it up to about 329 when we finished. Um, and so it went for a good beat. It's still going. There's a couple of uh, shots in the film where it gets destroyed, uh, broken into. Um, and also, you know, we had our fair set of challenges and setbacks with breakdowns, stuff like that, but we got through it and we kept playing our music, asking people, telling people about the cause, telling about the film that would ultimately come out, which it is in the next two weeks. Uh, October 6th. And then, um, and then also just keep repairing it and keep going. I think that's kind of emblematic of life. We all are kind of broken and, you know, feel beaten down, but at the same time, we just usually get enough to get to that next week and we'll see what happens, you know? I mean, I, I, I drove a Volvo back in the nineties. Those things are built like a tank. I do have they are. <laughs> a tank. Literally. I felt, even though she kept breaking down, but like, I did feel very comfortable like knowing if there's ever an issue the way that they build that with all the uh steel is just it's a cage so it was very cradling and those old leather seats man they were about as broken in as you could have so i mean it was like on the ground it was like an old baseball mitt i mean that thing was like it was ready to just it was it was it was our home for that a long, for a long, long time, time for a long, long time. time now i I, I want people to watch a documentary because there, 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 there's a bunch of things that happen on your guy's journey, but what keeps you going and, and say, we're not going to give up. Oh man. I would say just like in the film, a lot of times it's being intercepted by people who have, who are inspired, who want to share their emotional lift with you and i think that uh what happened in the film is that you know there was a point where i don't want to ruin it for people but we had a real challenging moment and we were sitting in the car kind of thinking about how we're going to pull back the tour we're going to maybe pull back some of the things we're going to do because we're just maybe going too far and too hard too fast to go to all 50 states and do that and literally as we're having this moment of solidarity and kind of like we get a knock on the window and you know we roll it down. And in that moment, we just kind of forgot where we were, you know, we're just kind of upset. And this guy's like, 
excuse me guys, but what's the deal with the car? And it just changes the energy of our lives. And I feel like that is the reoccurring theme throughout the film, throughout our lives in music is that we, we go as hard as we can. And then when we get to those lows, which we ultimately do, and we all do, it's that's when others pick you up when you do good work and you invest in people and your time and energy and try to lift others up then when you need to be lifted up they can help you and um, that's a theme that we've seen in movies that we love it's a wonderful life and uh, other films as well and we really think that that story has to be told and retold generation after generation in different ways to remind people that there's good people out there and that we're not the center of the universe we're not living isolated from everyone that we are part of a larger community and we can help each other along the way yeah and i would say the things that got me through for sure were people and i do have a lot of faith i have a faith in the divine and so in those low moments when i'd be like you know, sleeping in the car, like crying myself to sleep. Cause I'm just like, what am I doing out here? I would just be praying. I'd be like, all right, please just show me the way. Like, like, please help us. And literally like somebody would come up the next morning and see the car. And they'd be like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And they'd be like, Hey, here's like a hundred dollar bill, like for gas. And you're like, where did you come from? Did you just roll out of that bush over there? Like, who are you? And like, this would happen over and over again. And in some of our lowest moments, you know, there would sometimes be hang time for those moments. It would be like, you know, the break-in was rough. It was thousands and thousands of dollars worth of gear stolen out of the car, which led to other things that happened that you see in the film. But like, even though the heartache would be there, I felt like there was always a way out. There was always hope because there were people that were lifting us up, like you said, but it was just very, there are so many divine and kismet moments that just blew me away. I would actually borderline call many of the miracles. So those are the things that I held on to when it got really dark and really scary. And, and even in the brokenness of our society, we had a lot of deep conversations with people about, you know, polarization, differences, um, love, hate, how do you overcome these things? And I think these are really important topics to have, because if we don't talk about the world that we want, if we don't project the world that we want to have, we're just going to keep ingesting the world that is projected to us. That's trying to control us. That's trying to divide us. And it's like, we have to get out of that matrix. It's like, it's totally, it's up to us. There's more of us than there are of the people who are trying to control us. So I think it's really important to remember to love each other and to, to be selfless in doing that because we're right. We are not the, we're not the center of the universe, even though social media and everything's trying to tell us that we are. <laughs> <laughs> Most excellent. I mean, it, it, it I, I don't know, 50 states, 250 plus days uh, together. Um, speaking of unity, how, how did this make your relationship uh, stronger? Yeah, I think that any sort of adversity that you can face as a couple, as an individual is always going to, it either breaks you or it strengthens you. And um, this was a challenge for us to make it to all 50 states, to carry a message of positivity when obviously negativity seemed like it was taking the, the, the wheel at that point in history. Um, and, you know, we just wanted to maintain a good, uh, positive outlook. And I think that in the relationship, the way that it worked was, you know, if I had a bad day, a lot of times she wasn't having a bad day or if she was having a bad day, a lot of times I wasn't. So we were usually never quite on that same wavelength of, you know, when she was down, I could maybe say, Hey, well, look at it this way or think yeah. of these things. Um, you know, there'll always be food to eat. There'll always be people to, you know, going back to the simple things. And I think that our relationship having lived through that, um, you know, having living through basically extreme poverty, yeah. you learn that you have to rely on something greater than yourself, whether that be, you know, the people around you or your loved ones, or, you know, and asking for help in a genuine manner. I think that going through that together really taught us the power of relationships and the power of not being alone on this journey. And, um, and I think in the film, you really get to see two people being pushed to their max, mm -hmm. um, trying to carry a, a message around the country and, 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 and create great music. And I think ultimately we have to lean into each other in order to make that happen. And I think that's the power of, 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 of love really. Great. And, um, let me, uh, start wrapping things up. Uh, tell us about, uh, your music, still making music and, and the name on Bergamot. Yes. So we are definitely making music all the time. We just released a new single called Roll It Up and we're really excited about that. It's kind of teetering in indie uh, yacht rock kind of territory, but we created the name The Bergamot in college in 2009 when yep. he went into a co-op for lunch 
and saw these little bottles of essential oil. And he like was like, what are these? I've never seen anything like this. And he smelled them and he, and the bergamot one smelled like summer and citrus and just like joyful, a joyful scent. And so he came back to me after I finished school, you know, college that day. And um, he was in the same college, my classes. And he was like, hey, he's like, I just found this thing called bergamot. I think we should name our band the bergamot because we were looking for a band name. I was like, bergamot what is that and he's like come here you gotta smell this and then I smelled I was like this is really cool and it it said on the little vial like uplifting and our whole essence of our music is even if the music has like a darker tone for a song it's always a hopeful message and so we named our band the bergamot and started touring in 2010 we've toured every single year since and uh we're very proud of the music we make it's a labor of love um and we both songwrite and this last album nathaniel wrote the album it's called far out i'll let him say a word about it yeah and another thing i want to say about bergamot too is that it's used to induce happiness and relieve stress and so we were like it's like a natural form of uh you know uplifting your mood so we thought that would be a really cool thing and there's bergamot station here in la which is also really rad so it was a cool word cool space um but yeah the uh and that was you know, and songwriting has been really fun over the last, you know, couple of years. We've been working really hard and continue to work hard through this time as we release the film. We want to get the soundtrack out for the the uh, the film as well. So there's there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on musically. We're excited to bring that into the world over the next couple of years. Most excellent. And one last one last thing before I depart. As viewers have a chance to watch this film around around the world, hopefully. What is the one most important lesson that you hope that they walk away with after watching your film? Yes, I think that the most important thing that we learned and we went on this journey to learn that it's not a shared narrative of a future. It's a narrative of a shared future, a future in which we can continue to hold space for others that we don't agree with mm -hmm. and that we can also allow others and people around us to have the same access to the resources to become successful as we all have. And so it doesn't mean you can't work hard. We all have to work hard to get to that space and continue to hold space for others. But it's not about vilifying other people and hating people that you disagree with, but rather maintaining space for them. And music is a great way. We do that in concerts all the time. We all come together to be uh, to listen to music and celebrate. And so we hope that music can continue to do that. And we hope that people can watch the film and see that vision again and have hope for the future. Yes. And and I would say on that note that it's very important for each of us individually to forgive ourselves and to learn to love ourselves <clears throat> because it's like the oxygen mask theory in an airplane. You know, if the airplane's going down, you have to put on your oxygen mask first and then your friends or your loved one next to you. But I think it's very important that when we learn to truly love ourselves, and love our flaws and love our, you know, inadequacies and forgive ourselves for our mishaps, that when we come to other people from a place of purity and light, that we're able to love them as they are and not tear them down. And I think in our society right now, with everything going on, it's so easy to be like, oh, I hate that person. They're different than me. They look different than me. And it's just easy. It's, it truly is easy to do that. You're just writing someone off and you're like, I'm going to go back to my life. But the truth is, in order to move forward, as a collective society, especially in a democracy that we have, we really have to learn to reach out and love people and be open-minded, open-hearted and open-spirited during these times to, to bridge these gaps and to just create a, a more strong and powerful and positive collective. Well said, well said. Well, hey, thank you very much uh, for carrying this conversation, uh, spreading your unity message. I mean, your film is very uplifting and beautiful. And hopefully a lot more people will view it and be inspired by the message that you spread across the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. This is a joy. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. Thank you. Shine on.